Well, this is Mark Uckefer. I'm Executive Director of the Fiber Optic Sensing Association and welcome to our October webinar. Uh, we're very pleased to have as our presenter this month, uh, Dr. Gareth Lees, who has had an extensive uh, history. I won't read his entire bio, but I will particularly note that uh, FOSA has been very privileged to have him during the past year as uh, chairman of our uh, technology committee, which he's done uh, extensive amount of work in, in advancing um, fiber optic sensing. This particular presentation is uh, beyond DAS, advances in distributed Raylan um, uh, sensing. Uh, well, I won't get into all the details because I'll leave Gareth with some, but uh, uh, this one, this presentation should leave time for some questions. So uh, at the end, uh, we'll be able to uh, share information uh, back and forth using the text box. Um, so Gareth, uh, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Okay, fantastic. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Mark. Um, yeah, so my name's uh, Gareth Lees. Um, I'm the Research Director of AP Sensing. Um, and as Mark said, um, I'm also uh, the chair of the technology committee for FOSA. So if you have any kind of questions after the presentation about either FOSA or AP Sensing and, and our products, then uh, please let me know. Uh, my email's on the screen. Um, so the title of my presentation is Beyond DAS Advances in Distributed Rayleigh Sensing. The title should become a bit clearer as we kind of go through the presentation. Um, my intention is um, to kind of explore DAS, um, some of the history um, and kind of where where we want to go with DAS and uh, where we want to go with distributed Rayleigh sensing in general. So my presentation's split into three uh, roughly equal sections. Um, there's probably 10 minutes or so just talking about AP sensing as a company and what kind of products and services we offer. Um, and where, where we've come from really and uh, what we're all about as a company. Then uh, I'm going to talk uh, quite a bit about the technology. It's obviously the bit which kind of interests me. Um, so I'm going to talk about DAS, a bit of history of DAS and where DAS kind of came from and a bit of the terminology around DAS products. Um, and I put there phase versus amplitude, but actually it's a lot more complicated than that. And uh, I'll, I'll try and explain a bit more about the differences in, in different DAS units. And then finally, I've got a, a kind of a case study about um, enhanced DTS, uh, where DAS can help uh, improve the performance of DTS, which is unusual if you consider DAS to be a distributed acoustic sensor. Um, it's obviously much more than that, um, and kind of hence the, the kind of um, unusual title. So uh, this is just a bit of background about AP Sensing as a company. Um, it actually um, spun out of uh, Agilent Technologies, um, but Agilent Technologies came from Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard is obviously, um, if you go back uh, 10, 20 years, it was a, a test and measurement company. Um, it's obviously moved on into other areas um, and passed the test and measurement baton over to Agilent Technologies which has then turned into Keysight Technologies. So uh, a number of changes of identity there, but um, the, the test and measurement kind of um, background is, is still there and it's still in Bublingen actually, in, in the same building that AP Sensing, uh, there's still Keysight Technologies, um, still producing test and measurement equipment. Um, so uh, uh, we're, we're in there with a good crowd of, um, of expertise. We've got a, a pretty global presence. Um, as I said, uh, the, the, the headquarters are still in the, uh, the original Hewlett Packard building uh, in Bublingen, Germany. There is a, a facility in Basingstoke, which is where I'm based, uh, which is predominantly signal processing, data science um, and, and software engineers. But then around the world, we've got various operations and sales centers covering uh, North and South America, uh, the Middle East uh, and the Far East, uh, including kind of China, Korea uh, and Singapore. So there's a, a kind of a diver diverse range of um, um, areas there. We, we cover quite a, quite a few markets. A lot, a lot of them are, um, are DTS only. Um, so the obvious one on this particular slide is fire detection. Uh, there's, it's obviously a big market for DTS. It's the kind of core 
um, area and core application for us. There's always a need for, for DTS products um, in areas such as tunnels, um, where you can run a fiber um, covering the, 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 the entire length of the tunnel um, and large infrastructure as well. So fire detection is kind of a core DTS um, application area. And power cable monitoring as well was kind of core DTS. Um, if you go back even to the, the 80s, um, power cables would be monitored with distributed temperature sensors, um, primarily to, to, to so that the loading on the cables could be controlled based upon the temperature of the cable. More likely now, you would have DAS as well as DTS looking for TPI events around your cable or faults on your cable. So although some of these markets were, were originally DTS markets, we're seeing a lot more DAS start to, to come into those kind of areas. LNG monitoring is again predominantly DAS, uh, sorry, DTS, where you're looking for leaks within the annulus of the kind of storage vessels. Similarly with pipeline monitoring, sometimes you would have a DTS and you're looking for leaks in the annulus of the pipeline, but more often than not, now uh, you would install a, a DAS and look for third party intrusion events and try and predict damage before it actually happens using the acoustics um, in the area surrounding the pipeline. Um, so some more application areas, um, well and reservoir monitoring is for, for DAS. Um, it's quite an exciting area, especially in this kind of seismic world. The, the ability of a, a DAS to measure the, the acoustic signature along the entire length of the fiber in, in one go kind of makes it well suited to, to replace or at least complement existing geophone um, seismic surveys where you'd have to lower geophone into the well then gradually pull it out a bit at a time to take a measurement with the fiber optics you can get a, a reasonably good um, one component measurement uh, along the entire length of the well in quite a short space of time so on oil rigs where time is at a premium and, and costs a lot of money fiber optics is actually um uh, is working quite well it's got a nice application there one i'm particularly excited about is train and rail monitoring um uh, especially for das um, rather than dts the ability to locate and look at the velocity of trains and timetabling that's that's exciting but being able to look at track and, and train um, quality, so looking at whether there's cracks in the track or flaps on the wheels, that also is quite an exciting application within the train and rail monitoring area. Um, and there's there's quite a lot of activity in, in that market at the moment. Geo and hydrological is also a market which has been around for uh, for a long time. Um, large civil engineering projects and large assets. Um, perimeter security, again, primarily DAS, looking for um, third party intrusion um, onto critical um, areas such as airports, as illustrated by the picture there, uh, but also critical assets such as um, um, other, other cables, uh, critical cables or, or borders or, or anything where you have a very long length um, to monitor. Um, DAS works pretty well in those kind of areas. So uh, this, this kind of uh, slide tries, tries to explain a bit about um, uh, the company as a whole and the kind of our, our kind of uh, our viewpoint. We're very much a technology focused company. When the company started, we had a DTS technology based upon code correlation, which if you're not familiar with DTS, is, is just a, a, a way of uh, making a temperature measurement. Uh, and if you go back 10 years, the ranges were quite short. Um, an eight kilometer system uh, would be you know, quite a nice range to have for a DTS. But if you look at where we are now, 10 years later, um, we're, in terms of range, we're world leaders, certainly for DTS, uh, Raman based DTS, where 70 kilometer single and multi-mode systems uh, are available. But on top of that, we're on our third revision of DAS as well. So technology is kind of a, a real, core driver for us and i think that's kind of illustrated in in the amount of our revenue we then feed back into r d it's uh, if you look at the, the a lot of other large technology companies 
um, we're, we're trying to keep up there. We we're trying to invest in the in, in the development of uh, pushing forward uh, distributed fiber technologies because it is a fantastic and exciting area to be in, and there's uh, so much more to do in this kind of area. So uh, that's just a kind of a slide, just illustrating kind of uh, the, the kind of growth in the in our technology um, going forward. So. In terms of what we kind of offer, so the, obviously the core of our business is the, 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 the instruments themselves. Um, and although we, we have DTS and DAS, within each of those kind of categories, there's actually a, a large number of um, variants. So for, for DTS, we offer different um, numbers of optical channels. We obviously offer multi-mode versus single mode monitoring, um, but also uh, we offer uh, different ranges with different performance specifications at each of the ranges. And the same kind of applies to our DAS as well. Um, although we offer standard uh, ranges for DAS, uh, 20, 50 and 70 kilometers, um, we also have a high performance version as well, which has um, a much higher um, underlying performance to give you the best quality DAS measurements you can, albeit at shorter ranges. So. Although there's two product ranges, with each of those ranges, there's actually quite a lot of variety. Um, moving forward from the instruments, um, we, we can take the instruments and we, we can package them in lots of different ways. And, and actually, although the instruments where all the technology is, a lot of the engineering effort is actually um, in installing it in a, in a way which is reliable and robust. Uh, we offer wall mounted solutions primarily for fire detection and the fire markets. We also offer ATEX enclosures for areas where um, um, there's gases or potentially um, explosive gases. We also have very low temperature enclosures down to minus 40 degrees C as well. On top of the enclosures, there's also uh, um, a need to provide rack solutions. Uh, in this particular picture, there's a project which requires five uh, racks. Um, within each rack, we can offer different redundant systems. Um, there's obviously a lot of different ways to um, carry out the networking and the, the control of data on top of um, uninterruptible power supplies, uh, different backup solutions for the data which we collect with our systems, and obviously different levels of operator display as well and engineering displays. So. It's quite a key part of our business, uh, carrying out the, the, the kind of solution part of the business. On top of all this hardware, we're, we're very much uh, a software company um, in that or with even the best hardware in the world, if you don't take advantage of that um, hardware and if you don't extract the value from your data, um, then it's, you know, you're, you're not providing the best service to your client. So at the kind of core of our software, we have a package called Smart Vision. And Smart Vision um, uh, takes all of the data from DTS and DAS instruments, um, and it consumes all that data, and then it, it can provide different algorithms depending on which application you're in to process the data and extract the value. And we can also display that data in lots of different ways, either on an asset view, or a map view or 3D map view or um, satellite imagery and many different types of ways of displaying the data. But it also provides the interfaces with other systems such as CCTV camera systems, um, Modbus uh, interfaces, OPC, many different protocols um, with which to talk to other parts of the, the, the system. It's also scalable, so you can have smart vision consoles in different areas of your, your facility, um, in different in, in control rooms. You can have operator terminals with limited functionality. And uh, in the engineering areas, you can have um, um, different displays and, and different um, uh, setups for your smart vision. Behind smart vision, actually at the, the, the kind of instrument level, and I'm focusing a bit more on DAS now, there's uh, an entire um, range of tools available to configure um, DAS instruments. And it's primarily come around because there are so many different application areas, different application areas require different um, needs from the software and different configurations. So um, we have quite a powerful set of software behind, which allows you to set up 
um, based upon your fiber configuration, different rules. And the rules would be things like, um, is, is an event traveling with a certain velocity range? Uh, is an event um, more than 50 meters long or less than 200 meters long? Um, and is it a strong event, a weak event? What kind of frequencies does it excite? Uh, and that all is kind of common sense. But then underlying all of that, there are um, some very powerful machine learning models built into the software, which we can use to provide additional confirmation that what you're actually uh, observing the signal from is what you're expecting. So uh, the machine learning understands what mechanical digging looks like, it understands what cars look like, uh, and walking, and the machine learning um, part of the, 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 the software then gives you a bit more confidence that what you're seeing is actually what we're telling you it is. So uh, this kind of um, analysis and configuration tool is actually very powerful and we can generate different machine learning um, capabilities depending on what particular application you're looking at. Um, it's always good to have some videos. So um, I've got a couple of videos here. Um, hopefully they'll both work. So again, this is just different ways of visualizing data. Um, again, it's a train application. Now, the good thing about trains is that they're pretty big signals. Um, so the, the bottom left is a smart vision display. It's just a satellite imagery and there's just two trains crossing. Um, the top right display is more of an engineering display. It's just showing at the moment, scrolling onto the bottom of the display, a train leaving a station. Uh, each one of the large circles there is a confirmed, this is a train. And within each one of those kind of blobs, there's a lot of information about the train, such as the width, um, the speed, um, the, the location, where it came from, and, and lots of other stuff as well. So the, 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 the software is pretty modular and it's designed to address a large number of different applications. And, and the way it's set up is, a, is pretty powerful to, to address different markets. Okay, so I'm going to go on to talk a bit more about DAS measurements now. Um, and I've tried to put this in, in, in a kind of way that's reasonably easy to understand uh, without going too deep into the technical things. Um, DAS is, and, and DTS actually for that matter uh, are both OTDR based technologies. Um, you both have pulses of light. Um, you send these pulses of light down the fiber and then you look at what comes back. Um, and the time between sending the pulse of light and you getting a signal back, um, similar to a radar, gives you the distance down the fiber. For DAS, what we're looking at is, uh, is a coherent Rayleigh effect. And from now on, I'm going to be trying to be quite careful with the wording I use, just so that when I come to some slides later on, you'll, you'll understand why. Um, and the coherent Rayleigh effect is affected by is ch uh, minute changes in the optical path length of the fiber. And those optical path length changes uh, can be caused by thermal, acoustic, vibration or strain events. So the coherent Rayleigh effect is the underlying physical mechanism by which a, a DAS operates. We then look at this Rayleigh backscatter, this coherent Rayleigh backscatter, and we process the signals and we then display those signals um, either in frequency charts or, or, or amplitude charts, illustrating then what that disturbance might be caused by. Um, a, an example I usually give is if you have an idling engine, which is roughly 900 RPM, um, then that will look like a 15 Hertz signal. Um, so by looking at the frequencies of the events, you can kind of draw some conclusions as to what it might be. So terminology, yeah, this, this presentation is actually the first time I've tried to put a slide together to discuss kind of terminology. And it, it's actually quite challenging. I mean, if you go back to 1984, uh, people were talking about coherent Rayleigh noise and coherent fading effects uh, for OTDR signals or backscatter signals. Um, so even back in the 80s, uh, the, the terminology was there to kind of explain some of the things we, we, we use now for, for um, acoustic 
um, sensing. And then if you kind of go forward from that, uh, and again, some people might know some earlier papers, but the earliest paper I could find with uh, distributed acoustic sensing was 2005. Um, and distributed vibration sensing, DVS, was 2008. And then a lot of people now talk about amplitude-based DAS and phase-based DAS. And as I kind of went through and looked at all the different terminologies, I came to the conclusion that when I got to 22 different terms to describe DAS, I decided that actually uh, the, there is no common phrase to, to really describe or, or what would be the most common phrase to dis describe what we're actually doing. Um, and it's a distributed measurement. There's no doubt about it. We send a pulse of light down and we look at what comes back. Therefore, it's a distributed measurement. We All of the measurements rely upon Rayleigh. Um, certainly the ones I'm discussing today do. Um, and uh, we use it as a sensor. So uh, the best I could come up with was a distributed Rayleigh sensor. And, and that then takes into account the, 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 the physical mechanism we're using. Um, but also it doesn't limit it to acoustics because uh, a, a, a DAS or a distributed Rayleigh sensor is not just an acoustic sensor. Um, and it's not just a vibration sensor. It, it, it can actually do a lot more. And I, I think in order to do the technology justice, um, calling it a DAS is not giving it to its full potential. Um, so uh, a bit more about technology and, and why some of the con confusions kind of uh, arisen regarding terminology. So um, on the right hand side um, at the top, we have a, a, an OTDR. Um, again, it's a Hewlett Packard OTDR and uh, that picture comes from the HP Journal in 1988. Um, below that, there's a, a picture of a, a typical backscatter, coherent Rayleigh backscatter um, from a paper in 1984. And then below that, we have uh, an original um, A version AP sensing DAS. Now, all three of those um, um, papers and, and products, they all use um, the, the schematic or they all use the concept outlined in the schematic on the left. They all use a light source, they generate a pulse, um, and they look at what comes back, um, uh, the Rayleigh signal that comes back. The difference between the, the conventional OTDR from HP at the top um, and the kind of two systems below is that the, 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 the a conventional OTDR might use an SLED, um, which is a broadband light source. Um, and the coherent effects, as outlined by Healy in that electronics letters, uh, and is used by the original AP sensing DAS um, from about four or five years ago, uh, they use a coherent light source. So the difference in those technologies on the right hand side is purely the, the light source which is used. Um, and if HP had used a narrow line with source in that top OTDR, they would have got a nice jaggedy picture um, as shown in, in the middle there. So this is still a phase OTDR. So um, the, the AP sensing original DAS and, uh, and uh, uh, Healy's paper there, it's still measuring the phase of the light, but within the pulse which you're sending down. So to all intents and purposes, it is a phase DAS. Um, and it's a coherent OTDR as well. So if you if you say you, you have one of these instruments and you call it a phase DAS, that's perfectly correct. Um, but nowadays, phase-based DASs, uh, uh, that term is being used for a more, um, a more useful technology. Um, and I'll go on to that in a minute. Um, so with with that previous technology, with the um, the, 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 the the kind of um, the basic COTDR, if you take an input signal, um, you get an interference pattern, and um, what you get back is a speckly pattern. It's like if you shine a laser pointer at a rough surface and reflect onto a wall, you'll see a speckle, an interference pattern. Um, the, the 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 early fiber DASs were the same. Um, you, you 
shone your narrow line with source down and you'd get a one dimensional speckle pattern back. You'd have high areas of intensity where the signal was constructively interfering within the pulse and low areas of intensity where it was destructively interfering. Now, the problem with that is that within that transfer function, you apply an input signal depending on where it sits in that interference transfer function. You can have it, you can either get the signal out, uh, which you put in which is uh, if you sit at the, the quadrature point there, the midpoint of one of those rising edges. Uh, or you can get an inverted polarity, which if you're sitting on the other edge, um, or you can actually get twice the frequency if you just happen to be sitting at the, the, the bottom section here. And, and what makes matters worse is that this slope, um, so the sensitivity of your transfer function varies as well. So essentially you've got a, a totally unpredictable output with relation to your input signal um, with this kind of basic DAS technology. Um, it's fine if you want to know if something's happening. So you apply um, a signal if you have your, um, your idling engine again, sat there at 900 RPM, you would be able to see that something was happening. Um, it might look like 15 Hertz, it might look like 30 Hertz. And you might measure it one day and you get a certain um, polarity. You might come back the next day, you would get a different polarity um, or even a different uh, frequency doubling would be higher than the, the fundamental. So the, 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 the issue with that early versions is that what you get out isn't necessarily what you put in. Um, all you can say is that you've put something in and you've actually got something coming out. So it's great for detecting things. Uh, but not so good for actually reproducing them. Um, and actually, uh, I've tried to explain something here, but um, if you've got access to um, the introduction on distributed optical fiber sensors by Arthur Hartog, there's a really nice picture on page 237, which has a great way of explaining um, in a bit more detail what I've tried to explain in this particular slide. So here's an, here's an, an output, an example um, of what that particular type of DAS um, signal looks like. So it's a very simple uh, rock drop. Um, we've dropped a rock on the ground, uh, the cables underneath it. Um, and the signal on the left, the grayscale signal, uh, yes, you can see something's happened. Um, you can see there's large areas of uh, intensity here. Um, there's parts here where it's quite weak. Um, and there's parts here where it's very strong. And again, very strong here. Now. Although the signal's strong on the output, that's not to say that the signal's strong in the ground. It's just to say that on the transfer function, it's at the peak. You're getting the most out for what you put in. So although the signal looks strong in places, that doesn't represent what's actually happening in the ground. So yes, you can see something's happened, um, but you can't really extract from the signal what the signal strength is in the ground. Um, not easy anyway. <clears throat> so moving on to kind of uh, other different types of DAS technology, um, I'm going to explain a bit more detail about um, a technology called dual pulse technique. Um, there are actually quite a few ways uh, of doing this um, kind of concept. Um, dual pulse technique is one of them, and it's um, quite an early one um, from uh, oh, certainly the 1980s, 1988, I think. Um, there's also interferometric uh, receiver techniques, um, heterodyne techniques, homodyne techniques, and many other different types of techniques for doing the same thing. Um, actually, the AP Sensing as a company don't use this technique, but it's, it's really quite straightforward to explain. So um, I'll stick with it for, for the time being. So th the way this technology works is instead of putting one pulse down the, the fiber, um, they actually put two pulses down, separated by a distance, uh, maybe 10 meters. Um, so you get effectively two back scatters, and those back scatters are slightly spatially separated when they get back to the receiver, uh, but also they're at different frequencies. So what you get at the output is uh, the difference in the frequencies, so I'll call it here the carrier frequency, um, and then a, a, an envelope 
which is kind of the jaggedy appearance that you see on your amplitude traces. Now, the phase of this carrier frequency, let me run to the next one, the phase of the carrier frequency is proportional to the input signal. So you're looking at the difference in phase between two different locations, and that difference in phase is proportional to what you put in. So if you have an input signal and you look at the changing phase of this carrier, so if you measure the phase of this carrier signal, um, the changing phase of that carrier signal will be proportional to the input signal. Therefore, what you get out is what you put in. And if you repeat that experiment again, in fact, this was acquired simultaneously with the previous experiments. Both systems were run on um, the same cable at the same time. Um, you'll see that you'll get a, a, a nice waveform um, and where it's weak it's where the, the coupling is weak um, and it, it's it's not it's a representative signal of what's actually in the ground so it it's a much better linear repeatable measurement and you can do a lot more things with it as an example we kind of repeated that that drop test four times separated, I don't know, by five or 10 minutes. And you can then, because the signal's repeatable, you can just stack them and you can just stick them on top of each other. So time a line and stack. Um, and you can see you get a really nice um, set of wave fronts. Um, you can see signals um, where you couldn't see signals and the signal to noise ratio, the underlying measurement is improved uh, as well. So having that repeatability and that linearity opens up a lot more signal processing techniques. <clears throat> so this again is another example showing um, the, the, the early, this is again, is AP sensing's early DAS um, at 25 kilometers. Um, and you can see that the, the signal um, on the plot on the left, um, it's kind of a bit a bitty, there's bit, it's not a uniform intensity along it and it should be. The plot on the right is from a, a differential phase DAS where we're, we're doing this differencing in phase along the length. Um, and you can see that the signal is a, a uniform strength along the, 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 the vibration at that point. But also we're doing this at 49 kilometers and previously we, we were doing it at 25. So the, although we call them both DAS, they're, they're definitely not the same in terms of the signal quality um, and what you can do with the signal afterwards as well. So. It, once you have something which is repeatable and linear and, and, and you're happy that what you're getting out is pretty much what you put in, that then opens up a, a, an entire range of different uh, ways of, of measuring what your system can do. So the plot on the right there is all of these measurements are from, from CFOM. Um, there is a, a document called the DAS Parameter Definitions and Test Document, um, which came out in 2018 um, from CFOM. Uh, where the vendors all kind of got together and decided on a set of tests. Um, so these are the kind of AP sensing outputs of some of those tests. Um, we can measure the underlying noise repeatedly. Um, the, the, the plot on the right there, the one predominantly red, just shows the dynamic range of the system and the linearity of the system. Um, and the, the ones at the bottom show the, the kind of spatial resolution of the system. And you can measure it on, on one day and you can come back and you can measure it and you'll get exactly the same results a week or two weeks, a month later. So it, this, you, you, you don't have any kind of variability within the, um, the system itself. It's a, it's a nice linear system. <coughs> but what really is, um, makes me kind of excited about this kind of um, improved linearity is that it makes your signal processing so much easier. Um, if a signal looks like an event on one day and the same signal comes again a week later, um, it should look exactly the same. And uh, if it does, then it just makes your signal processing so much easier. And it makes um, a lot of the machine learning um, algorithms and models we're looking at, they work so much better if the results are repeatable um, and are the same um, time after time. So. In this particular um, schematic here, we've kind of got three potential events. Um, the size of those kind of event clusters, based upon the, the different features, if we had a convention, if we had a, an older type DAS, they would be much more statistical. They would be bigger. There'd be more overlap. Um, 
but with a, the with a modern DAS system, a linear DAS system, um, you can actually um, do a lot more clever stuff with the signal processing. Um, so where are we going to go next? So um, this is uh, just a plot showing, uh, I've kind of switched over to the frequency domain. So uh, most conventional DAS measurements occur between one hertz and maybe 500 hertz. Um, and that's kind of where we were five, 10 years ago. Uh, that's kind of where the, the, the signals of interest kind of lie with a lot of TPI um, activities. Going to much higher frequencies, I think is quite interesting, but not because there are frequencies of interest there, but because if you can put more pulses of light into your fiber, um, you can generate a lower noise floors or improve your dynamic range. So there are reasons for, for sampling very quickly, and there is some work being done in various research institutes uh, to try and push that uh, higher frequency range so we can put more pulses of light in our fiber but again it, it's usually not to pick up very high frequency events it's to improve the performance of the underlying DAS a lot of the really interesting stuff is being done at the, the low frequency end um, and I've kind of called I've got the green and the red there one for established markets and that's kind of stuff which is everyone understands it's all out there and it's fine a lot of the current activity is being done in the, the very low frequency um, end of the, 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 the measurement, um, where you're looking at 0.1 hertz, 0.01 hertz, uh, and even lower. Um, so there's a lot of value down there because uh, although we call it a DAS, it, it does respond to temperature, it does respond to strain. Um, and as I get uh, you know, a couple of slides on, I'll explain how we, we've used this kind of low frequency part of the, the, the distributed Rayleigh sensing um, measurement to actually improve our DTS performance. Um, and again, if you go far enough, um, the, the kind of holy grail almost is to get down to a, an underlying DC measurement where you can take a measurement of strain and temperature and know what the temperature is and know what the strain is um, based upon the Rayleigh backscatter. Um, but uh, again, that's that's not a subject for this particular presentation. OK, so enhanced DTS. So the, the final part of my presentation. Um, so DTS, Raman DTS, it's, a, it's a, a robust and reliable measure of the temperature of the fiber. Um, what you get back tells you the temperature. It's a pretty fundamental measurement um, and it, it works really well. Uh, of the Rayleigh measurement, if you look at the kind of uh, the, the changing phase or the changing optical path length of your fiber as a function of temperature, um, you can you can tell whether the temperature is increasing or decreasing by looking at the changes in, in, in the phase of your signal. So if you've got um, a um, a good linear DAS, um, you can figure out if your temperature is increasing or decreasing. And if you combine the two together, you can use that DAS information to make your DTS measurement um, a lot better and a lot better in, in two different ways. One is the DAS is sending a pulse of light 2000 times a second um, or, or even faster. Um, and what you're getting back then is, is meaningful um, at those kind of rates. You know, you're not having to average. Um, you can, so you have a very fast, idea of what the temperature is doing um, but also you can then by looking at your acoustic sensor by looking at that you're changing optical path lengths as a function of temperature you can give an estimate as to how much the temperature is changing on quite a short time scale as well so the combination of the two is actually quite powerful now here was a, an experiment i actually um put this out and um, showed it about a year or so ago. It's a, a really simple experiment. It's a lab experiment. It was a, a DAS and a DTS, both on the same, exactly the same fiber with a hot plate and a, um, um, a technique for increasing the, the, the fiber um, up to 70 degrees C over a short period of time. So uh, you just push a button and the, the temperature increases. So the plot on the left is your standard DAS output. And 
that's showing the rate of change of temperature. So it's almost showing the, the differential temperature. The plot on the right is another output of our system called DTGS, and that's the accumulated phase over a long time period. And if you look carefully, the peaks here of where the temperature is the hottest correspond with the center here. So this is where the rate of change of temperature is highest and the rate of decrease in temperature, but this is where the temperature is highest. So the two outputs are actually really nice. So you can see them quite clearly um, on the DAS. And that kind of started us off thinking what we could do with this. Um, and this again was that output um, I, I showed about uh, 12, 18 months ago. And we basically used the DAS measurement to compensate the DTS measurement. And again, it worked really well. The orange line is the compensated and the underlying blue line is the original DTS measurement. So we thought, how far can we take that? And we, we um, uh, actually, I'll, I'll come back to this slide. Um, in terms of how far you can take it, this was a, a similar measurement, but on a commercial basis. And this is at 69 kilometers. And the blue trace there is the DTS and the orange trace is the EDTS. So we, we've taken a, a conventional DTS measurement and then we've, uh, we've corrected the noise on the DTS using the information from the DAS. So in order, uh, the kind of results we're getting there are on a measurement time of 30 minutes and a range of 70 kilometers, we're down to about two degrees C RMS noise um, on the EDTS measurement. And the plot in the bottom left is actually the original plot um, from Smart Vision. Um, so uh, the EDTS bit of code is in our Smart Vision software and we feed in the DTS data, we feed in the DAS data um, and it comes up with a better measurement of temperature. Uh, and that's a really good example of how we can um, change, modify um, a really nice temperature measurement to be even better. This actually shows, although the, the, the DTS is churning out a measurement every 30 minutes, um, for these particular long ranges. Um, this is actually showing the output of the DAS every 10 seconds. And as the temperature ramps up, you can see that we this is going from 30 to 70. You can see you've got a really nice ramp. And then the, the top plot is a zoom in of that ramp. And it's basically showing what the DAS is providing every 10 seconds. So not only do you get a more um, a better space, uh, sorry, a better temperature resolution on your trace. You also have this ability to look every 10 seconds and see uh, what your temperature is. So you, you've got a much better measure of um, temperature resolution, but also a measure, uh, much shorter measurement time as well. Back to this trace. Um, a lot of questions generally arise about how you separating temperature and, and strain out from each other. Um, there's two really big things which go in our favor. One is that temperature changes are generally quite slow signals, um, just because of the th either the thermal mass of the cable or the, the thermal mass of what you're trying to measure. Um, but also the changes due to temperature are typically orders of magnitude bigger than um, things you would see, for example, in third party intrusion, or actually even in trains. Um, so the two plots on the right are, um, we, we have big machine learning libraries. So I just extracted all of the data from trains and all of the data from cars, um, just to look at what the kind of signal levels were. Um, and actually cars and, and even trains, they're fractions of a degree C equivalent temperature changes. So even though if a train went past, in terms of turning that into a temperature, it's still a small signal. So you, you're not really comparing like with like. So if you see a one degree C temperature change, that would be a huge signal, um, a huge acoustic signal to generate that kind of change in phase. Um, we typically use a figure somewhere between 500 and 1000 radians per degree C, um, which if you're familiar with what DAS performance is, that's many tens of uh, um, um, dBs above the noise level of the DAS. So um, in summary, um, 
uh, DAS terminology can be very confusing. And it's come about because of quite the quite long history of DAS um, and trying to differentiate all the different technologies. Um, to be clear, not all DAS systems are the same. Um, although we call them DAS, they all work on very different, well, a lot of them work on very different principles. So it's worth trying to understand the kind of techniques people use uh, within, within DAS systems. When the performance of the DAS is shown to be linear and repeatable, there are so many advantages to having that kind of technology uh, within your DAS unit. Um, from signal processing, from um, using that information to, to correct for temperature, for looking at um, strain measurement, all kinds of stuff become um, available to you if you have that nice linear measurement. Um, and using that low frequency, what we've demonstrated is that if you use the very low frequency content of a DAS, um, you can turn a ROM and DTS into something uh, incredibly powerful at very long ranges. Um, and you're getting down to kind of temperature resolutions, which are, you know, uh, uh, become useful for a lot of different applications. Uh, and actually, we still think there's improvements to be made in the, 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 the temperature resolution at that, that 70 kilometer. Um, and just to finish off, um, I think this is a, a really exciting field and uh, it's evolving very rapidly and there's many more really great things to come. So any questions? And I'll put my references in there as well. Thank you very much, Gareth. Uh, we already have a number of questions, but if you'd like to join the queue, um, there's a text box uh, to the right uh, where you can uh, type in uh, a question. Um, I'll deal with some of the procedural ones. Yes, the slides will be available. We'll actually be posting uh, the entire presentation, which includes the slides uh, on our YouTube uh, site and our YouTube page, I should say, and our uh, FOSA website as well with a link to it. Uh, the use of uh, conduit pathways typically is the preferred means uh, of fiber uh, cable deployments for many applications, uh, certainly obviously in uh, telecom infrastructure. Um, what is your view relative to the ability of DAS in conduit to effectively work uh, uh, as opposed to uh, a buried armored cable that's not in a conduit? Hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, great question, actually. Um, in my in my view, I mean, the obvious thing to say is that we've done measurements on both. Um, and uh, conduits, yes, are, are used quite widely. And uh, um, it's, it's the obvious thing to do when you're, you're uh, taking measurements or you're carrying out um, installations is to look at both um, the conduits and the direct buried. I think you get you do get different signals. There's no doubt about it. Um, the signals which um, appear in a ducted cable will look different to um, a direct berry cable. And actually, when we were putting together our machine learning libraries, it's, it's one of the things we, we have to have in there as to what is the cable deployment type? Is it ducted or is it directly buried? Um, saying that, a lot of the time, you could uh, there are certain circumstances where you would get a bit bigger signal um, if your cable was in a duct um, rather than directly buried. So it's not, you, it's, you can't generalize and say, um, a duct isn't as good as a direct berry. Uh, in fact, sometimes ducted cables um, provide better signals um, than direct berry um, uh, and vice versa. To me, they're just different. Um, and I would say that um, DAS technology generally works with both. Um, there may be um, very slight um, exceptions to that, but uh, um, I would say they'll work with both in most installations. It's just the signals will be different. And you can adjust for that. Thank you. Um, this actually, well, let me just ask this. Uh, what is the life expectancy of the uh, fiber optic cable? Oh, wow. Um, so I, I certainly know of cables which have been in the ground for many, many tens of years. Um, I think it largely depends upon the, the environment and the construction of the cable. Um, uh, having been involved with some uh, um, very um, very long subsea cables, if you if you put the effort in there, um, certainly you know many tens of years. Um, and uh, um, I'd be surprised if there was a. Um, 
I wouldn't be surprised if there were cables out there which were 40, 50 years old. So, uh, uh, yes, I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I think um, the surface equipment would need to be refurbished before the cable. <laughs> Sure. And and actually, this is somewhat of a follow up question, but actually from somebody else. Um, does the DAS, tech, DAS technology primarily work on conventional uh, fiber or does it rely or is it improved by enhanced specialty fibers uh, designed to improve uh, signal to noise? It's uh, again, it's a good question and it's quite a, um, a loaded it's quite, one. A loaded yeah. question. <laughs> Go ahead. It, yeah, no, it's um, uh, for some applications, um, enhanced backscatter fiber will help. Um, generally, where you've got high losses, um, if you certainly with, um, I would say some systems, if you took 10 kilometers of standard single mode fiber and then 10 kilometers of enhanced backscatter fiber, um, you probably wouldn't see much difference. Yes, you'd get a bit of signal back and you might have to turn your equipment down to compensate for the bigger signal. But where it works best is if you've got a 10 or 20 dB loss at the start and you're trying to boost a very low signal, um, then you can get some advantages over using enhanced backscatter fiber. And I think the next one is more of a clarification question. Is the light source in the system a continuous or a pulse la laser source? Uh, okay, so um, in most cases, it's a pulsed laser source. There is some research out there which use a, a quasi-continuous but frequency swept source. But as far as I know, most commercial DAS systems use pulsed laser sources. And how much of the sensing system relies on the performance of the light source, or I guess the laser? Uh, I'll stop there, yeah. Yeah, I'd say that the lasers are actually pretty good now. Um, so certainly uh, much better than they were 10, 10 more years ago. Um, I, I think the limitation is not the laser at the moment. In fact, uh, it's, it's quite an interesting question um, for other reasons. If you, if you take a, a cable and you directly bury it one meter below the ground, um, in most areas, the noise you see on your system will be the kind of noise which is generated in the, which is there in the ground, generated by whatever else is in the, in the area. And actually, if you um, have an isolated reference coil, um, when you when you attach the deployed cable, um, you'll just see um, a higher noise than your reference. So the limiting factor on a lot of these things is the environment you deploy the cable into, and not the system itself. Now, here's an interesting question in terms of application. Is it possible to use the DTS technology or, or DAS technology to monitor outdoor conveyor belts with a big weather changing? <laughs> uh, um, I think the, the environment is challenging. Um, anything where you've got very, if you, the, the DAS, the, the the underlying noise floor of a DAS is down to kind of peak strain or tens of peak strain. It's incredibly sensitive. Um, as soon as you take your cable and you start to physically move it due to the environment, through to, through wind and um, and the, the noise from an active conveyor belt, as soon as you start to actually start to shake the cable, um, that is a, a, a huge signal as far as the DAS is concerned. Um, and it becomes really challenging to do anything with uh, with those kind of signals and extract the kind of information you want um, from from the cable actually moving around and being shaken by the the application. Um, I think if you if you could deploy it in a way that you had isolation from a, a lot of things and only looking at the things you want to see, I think it's probably bearings in this case. Um, then it could work, but it, it's a, it's a challenging application. Sure. Does uh, uh, the AP Sensing DAS interrogator uh, flexible to adjust to the gauge length according to the application, and does it uh, or and does it use dual pulse technique? So, yes, we can adjust the gauge length. Um, that can be just adjusted in the software. Um, so. Um, when you're commissioning a system, um, the the software enables you to set the gauge length. 
Um, so it is configurable. The, there's no hardware changes. Um, and no, we don't use the dual pulse technique. Um, I think that the, there are a number of techniques, uh, three or four, and at their most basic level, I don't think anybody uses them. I think there's a lot more um, complex optical things you need to do to get a good DAS system to address things like fading, polarization fading, interference fading. There are a lot of things that people do now to um, optically to make a better system. So the, the kind of schematics which I draw up, they are very much simplified, very simplified versions of what most people use, I would say. So DTS is normally uh, done using fiber and loose tube cable. Does DAS provide a better signal when performed on cable where the fiber is within a tightly bonded jacket? Um, so if you're looking to, so there's two parts of that question, I think. If you're using the um, DAS to compensate for temperature. So if you're using the DAS in the EDTS mode, and it's in a tightly buffered cable, then you'll need to um, allow for the, the, the thermal expansion of the cable as well. So um, I would say if you're in a D e DTS mode and you want to use the DAS to get a better temperature measurement, then um, having it in the, the same kind of um, um, fibre and metal tube uh, construction would be beneficial. The DAS does work very well in, in both fibre and metal tube and in a tight jacketed construction. Um, for, for normal DAS applications. So I think I'll, I, I've been giving you some tough ones. So let me try and give you a little <laughs> easier one, Gareth. Uh, for pipeline with mechanical joint connection, is it possible to monitor 24-7, 365, any change in temperature, strain, PSI, or the movement of the pipe? So it's, it's interesting about joints because one of the features we have in our software is to um, just monitor sections of interest. Uh, one of the challenges with DAS is that it does generate a lot of data. Um, we actually have some systems in place to just look at particular areas. Um, and it's for, it's for exactly this reason. If, you, if you're just interested in particular sections um, and everything else you, you, you're either monitoring with another technology or you're not really interested in, then we can pay particular attention and set up, um, like I was shown in the software, you can set up different rules and um, different combinations of techniques to just look at those sections. Um, so it, it is possible to make the system so that it focuses on just areas of concern. Um, and some of the machine learning techniques we, we're using um, help in that regard as well. So it looks for changes rather than looking for specific things. <clears throat> this probably will be our last one because we're coming up to the hour, but hmm. can you get uh, good DAS signals with low coherence uh, length lasers or is the best signal with long coherence length lasers? Uh, interesting. Um, so uh, there's quite a bit of uh, technology behind that. I, th I think um, it does depend on what technique you use. Um, like I say, there's a, a large number of different techniques. I think you still need a certain coherence length of laser, but the underlying coherence length of the laser does not define, does not necessarily define your range, um, which might have been the case five, ten years ago, uh, that you couldn't exceed the coherence length of the laser, but that's certainly not the case with uh, a lot of modern techniques. Gareth, I'll uh, confess we've got a number of other questions, but I'm afraid we're coming up to the uh, top of the hour where we normally cut things off. Okay. Um, I will say that you've got your contact information up so people can uh, reach out to you. Obviously, some of the questions have been fairly, uh, uh, fairly detailed, fairly specific, and so that's probably the best way to handle that. Uh, but I will remind folks, too, that this entire presentation will be posted uh, fairly shortly on our YouTube page and will also be available with a link off our website. So uh, yeah. thank you for a uh, very great presentation, Gareth. Uh, we've actually had, I think, one of our largest attendances uh, so far. So uh, uh, <laughs> certainly you you created a lot of interest. And uh, thank you very much. Nice. And thank that you all. That concludes this uh, webinar. Thank you, Mark.